Um, so welcome everyone to the second uh, lecture of uh, 544, um, the course on uh, um, principles of database systems. So um, let me see. Let me start with the announcements. I have an, a couple of announcements, and so I need to switch between slides, which is not that easy. So uh, bear with me here. Um, first is uh, that uh, actually let me start by asking you uh, how many people uh, have done significant progress on the first homework? Uh, about half, and I don't see well at Microsoft. Can you? Uh, can I see a uh, show of hands? How many people have al almost finished the first homework at Microsoft? Ah, there are the pro procrastinators. Uh, we have about half um, of um, um, half of the people in this room have finished uh, has made sig significant progress on the first homework. Uh, let me ask in the converse. How many people have not yet logged in or not, not gotten the data yet? Okay, please do this. Uh, uh, if there are any problems, uh, then you need to contact Jessica uh, for the account. Uh, how many people are using their own servers? They are not rely how many people do not rely on the, uh, on the SQL server? Only one person. Okay. So that's also an option. Um, it's, it's, an, it, it's some, I know that some people in this class, they know SQL better than uh, what you need to know in order to answer this, uh, this homework. Uh, on the other hand, I hope you enjoy the existential universal quantifiers uh, and also some of the group eyes. Uh, and I know some of you are using very advanced, very complicated, very, how should I call it, very advanced uh, SQL con constructs to answer some of the queries. I did not have those in mind when I designed the queries many years ago. But if you want to ad use advanced uh, um, and rarely used SQL constructs, um, then feel free to do this. Uh, as long as they work on SQL Server. Uh, and the reason why they have to work on SQL Server is because this is how Jessica is going to grade them. She's going to grade them on SQL Server and uh, probably she won't have time to dig in deeper if uh, they don't work. So that's the first homework. The second homework uh, is uh, just a theoretical homework. Um, depending on where you stand, you might find it much easier or actually harder, depending on your, on your own ba background. Uh, it is posted, and you have to turn it in uh, in two weeks from yesterday, uh, October 19th. Uh, you will be asked to uh, do some uh, ER diagrams, which are really easy for everybody, and to solve um, uh, some sim relatively simple problems on the uh, on uh, on decomposing a relation in Boyce-Codd normal form. Both these topics, uh, I will cover both of these topics today in today's lecture. Uh, there is one fun uh, problem on this homework. Uh, you're giving a data set, which is uh, think of it as an, as an Excel spreadsheet, but it's actually a text file. Uh, you're being handed it. It has about 1,000 records. And you have to reverse engineer the functional dependencies and, the, uh, and to normalize this data set. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit during the lecture what, what this means. Um, for that, you need to use a database system. You have two options. Uh, either use SQL Server, uh, and now you have your own database, which is, uh, with, whose name is your uh, email address. So there you can create a database, and you can play with it, and you need this for, for the second homework. Or uh, you can already move to Postgres. So you, you, you can install Postgres on your own machine and start using it. You can also use Postgres in the labs. Is anyone planning to use Postgres in, uh, in the, uh, on, on the machines in the lab? Would you, would you like to use it? OK. Uh, so Jessica, are the instructions up to date for the? It should be. Just okay. email me if I OK. So uh, we have Postgres running there, and you're, you're welcome to, to use it. Uh, so you have a choice between these two uh, options. Both are good for uh, um, what for what comes next in, the, in this class. Uh, you also have to read from the book some of these instructions, uh, some of these commands for SQL: how to create tables, how to insert, how to modify tuples in, in, in tables. It's uh, really really easy. Uh, another announcement: um, somebody asked me to have regular office hours, so I decided to schedule them for Thursdays, five to six. 
Any problems with this? We can it on Wednesday itself. Wednesday. Easier. We can. Usually before class, I want to focus on the class, but um, uh, but I see the point. It makes more sense to uh, have some Wednesdays. Okay, so there is this proposal to move this to Wednesday. Five to six. Okay, so Jessica, can you update? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, and last time we did not uh, discuss nulls. Uh, I hope everybody knows what a null is. It's just a, day, a value that you can you can uh, store in an attribute whenever you, you don't have the value for that attribute. When you create a table, when you first create a table with a create table statement, this is when you can decide for each attribute whether you allow null, null values or you don't allow null values. Uh, it's it's a, sometimes an, an important decision. Uh, can you give me one example of a kind of attribute where you never want to allow null values? Okay. And a key. Actually, the system will, will reject uh, a, a, an attribute that a key, will reject a record if the value of, of that uh, of the key is, is not. Did you have a question here? Me? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, so that's that's about nulls. Now the interesting thing about nulls that I, I need to show you is this. Let's look at this query here. It's supposed it's, it's doing a group by, and uh, what it tries to do, it tries to join two tables, uh, product and purchase, and uh, there is a foreign key. Um, every purchase refers to a to a product name, which is a foreign key into name. And uh, the, the, the goal of this query is to compute for every month, um, the, not, not for every month, for, okay, it, it wants to compute for September, the total number of sales for each product. For each product we want to know, for each product name, we want to know how many items of that product did we sell in September. And I claim there is something wrong with this query. What's wrong? Yes. Uh, you aren't going to get any rows for those products that had no purchases in September. Exactly. We will not get any answers for the products that did not sell in September. How can we fix this? Yes. Well, you have to first decide if this is actually a problem for you, right? Yeah. Uh, first, I have to decide if that's a, a real problem. That that's correct. I didn't um, make this point, um, but um, I, I think the. The scenario here is that your boss asks for, for this list, okay? You don't want to have missing products from the list you sent to your boss. Yes? So, use an outer join? That's a solution. We use an outer join. What is an outer join? Yes? It's a join where um, it returns nulls uh, if there isn't a matching record in the second table. Exactly. So, in a regular join, Every table from every record from one table must match the record from the other table before we can output it, or vice versa. It's commutative. Every record in the other table must match with the record with here before we output this pair. In a left outer join, the left table, which in your case sits here, uh, a record from the left table will be included in the output anyway, even if it doesn't have a matching record on the right. If it has matching records, then it will be output once for each of the matching records. But if there is no matching record, then we output this record anyway. But what we do with the missing fields? With the fields that were supposed to come from the other table. None. There we put none. That's exactly the, the left outer join. And uh, on the slides, we had an example. This is the syntax. If you want to uh, join to do a left outer join between product and purchase, then you need to use this particular syntax. It's called left outer join. And then uh, in the, uh, you, 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 the, the join condition is not in the where clause, but it is in, the, in, a, in, a, in a new clause called on. Yes? Do you need to do something like uh, sum and uh, is null trickery to make the yes numbers uh, line up right? Because I guess a count star on something where you have a null product entry, sorry, a sale entry, is going to count as one, right? 
You're right, you're right. So this is uh, something I didn't pay too much attention to. But right now, uh, I want to, to illustrate the outer, the outer joint. This is the left outer joint. This is the semantics. Look at the two, two tables at the top. Here is product, and here is purchase. So if you look in, in product, uh, one click, one click didn't, uh, didn't sell. We never sold one click. However, when you do the left outer join, one click will appear uh, with now. Okay, that's the semantics. On the other hand, camera uh, occurs twice because camera was, was sold twice. So it's a strange semantics and the outer joints, because of this, of this bizarre semantics, they are difficult to optimize. Um, left outer join and right, right outer, outer join, they are no, no longer associative. It has this bizarre semantics that the tuple may occur, may be replicated many times, or it may be included exactly once if there is nothing, if there is no matching tuple on the other side. Good, so returning to our aggregate query, uh, in order to include all tuples that did not sell in September, we need to do uh, something like this. We need to replace um, replace the, um, the join with the left outer join. But then, as your colleague uh, noticed, we need to be careful what we count on, what we count. And count has uh, so once you once you manipulate data with nulls. You need to be aware that every single SQL construct has its own semantics of how, how it handles nulls. Uh, usually the semantics is intuitive. You can, you can just guess what the right semantics is, but in case of, of doubt, you have to read the documentation. You have to read the SQL standard. What do you think would count do? What does count of, of something return if, uh, if, if some attributes have nulls? How would you describe the semantics of count? Yes. Number of unique values of whatever you're passing into count. So count normally counts how many values you're passing into count, right? But uh, suppose we do count store, like here. Suppose one record has a store value which is null. Is that counted? Well, yeah, there is no way to, to know. Uh, you have to read the documentation, but I can tell you that's not going to be counted. So count of, of an attribute skips over the values of that attribute that are not. And that's good. That's exactly what we want, because after we do uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the outer join, uh, we know that uh, for the products where there was no, uh, no purchase, uh, store will be null, and for those products we just get zero, and that's exactly the semantics that we want. What happens if we put here count of star? Last time I argued that count of star and count of an attribute are the same thing. Are they still the same thing? No, because if we put count star, then we, uh, all the attributes are included uh, when uh, the system looks for null. And if one of them is not null, then it will be counted. And of course, some will be not null because we are including, um, well, star includes all the attributes. And at least those coming from the left table are not null. Okay, so this is how we use uh, nulls and outer joints. And some of the questions on the homework uh, require you to, to do exactly this construction. Any questions about nulls? Please also read the three-valued logic, which is on a few slides earlier, and you can simply get, get it quickly by reading two slides. So now, uh, for today, uh, I want to start uh, the lecture uh, with a discussion on this of this blog. How many people have read my Stonebreakers blog? blog? Uh, okay, like um, a good majority, I would say. So what he describes in this blog is um, a, a, like, it's like a, re a reply, it's like an answer to a movement called the NoSQL movement. The NoSQL movement says all data, relational databases are crap. We should use instead NoSQL databases. What do they mean? What is a NoSQL database? Yes? I thought the idea was that if you're not using the SQL um, features of a database, then why make it a SQL database in the first place? 
for instance, if you just need a tuple store. If you want to scale very high, uh, tuple stores are going to be faster than the SQL database, so using that is going to improve your performance on any given set of hardware. Sure. So let, we, we'll get there. Let's, let's discuss this. But okay. uh, let's first define what a NoSQL no database is. And he describes two such uh, types of databases. Do you remember? Yes. Usually a key value store. You, it's, uh, it's usually a key value store, which means uh, you, you're storing objects that consist of a key, a single key, and then uh, some value which, which is a payload. It can be multiple attributes. It can be uh, a blob, means, means binary large object. It, it can be some, some payload. He also describes the second document, uh, the, the, uh, document store. And to, uh, to be honest, I quite, quite, didn't quite understand the subtle difference. Can somebody explain to me? You know, the subtle difference between key value stores and document stores. Do, do you know the difference? Yeah. I think it's along the lines of uh, it's key value pairs associated with a document object, so that you could look it up across a couple different attributes and get to a single document object. I see. So, so it's like so a document store would be like a key value store, but one of the attributes in the value is a document itself, which is kind of a more special kind of um, um, data item. So what these database systems do, they uh, give up tables and they give up SQL. Uh, they only allow you to store and access uh, objects by, by the key value. OK, and then the, 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 the blog is about a, a discussion of where that extra performance com comes from and of um, why you're paying the, the, the cost of this lost performance if you're using a SQL a standard relational database system and what you can do about this. That is the, the essence of, of the blog. But early on, he distinguishes, he makes it very clear, um, the, uh, he makes a very clear point about what kind of workload these uh, NoSQL databases can support. And he defines two kinds of workloads for relational databases. I call them here the mystery X and mystery Y. What are the two kinds of workloads in a relational database? What are X and Y? Yes? Reading and writing. Uh, particularly in the key value stores, very high volume inserts and very high volume but unrelated reads. So read and write are indeed uh, two different operations, but I wouldn't call them workloads. Workloads it means uh, it's something at a higher level. It means a more, more, more it's a broader definition of how you access the data. Transactions. Yes, they are called OLTP. Let me write some. Let me use advanced technology here. Uh, oops. What's this? Ah, this is good. Um, they are called OLTP, online transaction processing, and decision support. What do, what do we mean when we say that a database uh, is used for OLTP, for an OLTP workload? Online transaction processing. What it kind of... We have lots of inserts processing of the, of the records in the database. In decision support, you just read and process what you want to put in. So, so we, uh, uh, I don't know if people at Microsoft, did you hear? Can you hear when people talk in the room? Not really, so I need to repeat what he said. Uh, he said that OLTP means mostly insert and update, and decision support means uh, uh, lots of reads. And I think it goes in the right direction. Uh, I would say that uh, OLTP means um, uh, lots of uh, updates indeed, lots of insertions, uh, deletions, and uh, modifications, uh, and also point reads, Re uh, reading a single record. Uh, or looking up a record by the key value or by, uh, by, some, uh, by, by some other uh, indexed attribute. Uh, they are called online transaction processing uh, because the, the, typical, the typical example is out of, a, of bank accounts. Right? If, you have, uh, if you think about bank accounts, uh, what you need to do? Well, a customer comes, he wants to withdraw money, so you need to access just one record, his account, uh, and do one update, That's, uh, well, maybe two updates. You need to move money from one place to, to another. So these, these, um, the, the workload consists of 
a large collection of simple modifications and simple accesses to the data. What is decision support? Complex queries. Complex queries. It is a query and a decision support that will not touch a single record or three records. This is decision support, a decision support uh, workload means think about complex group pies with many joints. And there is no way you can get around by simply, by hoping you're, you're going to use an index and quickly get to the data that the query asks. Because a query is probably a complicated group by and, and then some aggregation and lots of joints in the meantime and, and in between. So obviously, NoSQL databases, these uh, key-valued pairs, only support one of these workloads. Which ones? OLTP. The, the OLTP. This is where they are. So if you ever consider having uh, decision support queries uh, on your database, forget key-value uh, uh, key pairs. Then you, you must go with a, a relational database system or with uh, some, some uh, specialized database system, which is called the data warehouse. For, which, is, which is specialized for these kind of queries. Okay, so then he goes a little bit deeper and tries to explain. Uh, so yes, he, he agrees. Uh, key, value, key value pairs, uh, key, no, no SQL databases, which are key value stores, they are significantly um, uh, more efficient than relational database systems. But then he goes deeper and tries to analyze why. Where does, uh, they are not by, because uh, of, of, a, of, of a bad design choice, uh, but the design, the, 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 their design is motivated by, by certain needs, by certain functionalities that he analyzes in this paper uh, and that I'd, I'd like to uh, repeat a little bit. What is the first thing that he, he says here? He says, says something about stored procedures. Can you explain to me? What, what was he trying to, do, to say with store procedures? He was saying that the bottleneck is transfer of the data between the database and the client. And if you put everything in a store procedure, you cut off the bottleneck and everything. Exactly. The first bottleneck in a relational database system is that when your application needs to get just one record, think about the OLTP um, um, framework. When it needs to get one single record, that record is not handy. It's not in the same address space, not in the same server, on the same machine, in the same address space as your application. Instead, it needs to contact the database server. Remember the client-server architecture? The application runs on the client. Now it needs to contact the server. This is a TCP IP connection. Uh, it's a round trip. In addition to all the overhead of sp spawning a thread on the server or maybe a process, there are two, two ways to implement the relational database systems. Lots of overhead in addition to the TCP IP connection before you get that record back. Yes, a question here. Just the like a latency problem more than a straight throughput problem. It's definitely a latency problem, absolutely. So if, if it were a, a throughput, um, then I, I, I don't have numbers. I I'm, I'm usually don't work so, at such uh, low level systems, but throughput is pretty, pretty good. Uh, but remember in OLTP, it's a latency that kills you because that's the definition of this workload. Uh, every access to the data retrieves a small piece of data. So the latency really, really kills you. So this is an important idea to keep in mind. Because of the client server architecture, uh, the relational database systems, they suffer a huge penalty. Now, now we don't have to have a, uh, a client-server architecture. Do you know of database systems that are not based on a client-server architecture? Yes? SQLite 3? SQLite, yeah. How many people have uh, worked or heard about SQLite? SQLite. Uh, about three here, and at Microsoft, not many kinds of SQLite. Um, it's a fun system, okay? Uh, what it does is that uh, it, it, you, your, the query processor sits in the same address space as your application. It's essentially a library. It's great, no? It's much more efficient. Why, why, don't, uh, why doesn't SQL Server use it? Yes? It scales very badly. Um, well, in what sense? Wait, you don't have replication across many instances. It has to be 
with the with one instance of the running application. Absolutely, you, you can't have replication. But even um, if you think about our, our IMDb movie uh, database, uh, that's not replicated. <coughs> it's a single it's a single database. How would that work if we were to use SQLite instead of um, the IMDb? Yes. Well, everyone would have to have a copy of the database on their local server. Everybody must have a copy of the database, which is fine uh, sometimes. But what happens if you do updates? What happens if you have uh, uh, if your database is about bank accounts? Now you have a, a whole new set of problems, right? Because now all these copies of the of the bank account they need to be synchronized. Uh, it's a nightmare. So keeping the data in one place and uh, in, in a single server is it's a major design decision of the relational database systems, and it has to be that way for for certain reasons. Yes. So in the case of IMDb, does it have to be synchronized? Well, in IMDb, sure, we, we, could, we could give you each of you a copy because we never updated. Assuming that we did. Assuming that we did, then it, then it would be a nightmare. Because if you update your copy, uh, then that update needs to be replicated to all, all the other copies. Uh, uh, and what happens if there are conflicts? And what happens if, in the meantime, somebody reads? Uh, the record that you try to update and he reads a, a, stale, a stale version. It's a nightmare. And I, I'll get to that in a second. Yes? And for a lot of data, there's a big security concern. You can't have that data on client machines. That actually struck me because the, the main reason why uh, Mike Stonebreaker uh, said that uh, databases have this client server architecture, he said it's for security. Uh, well, he has a lot of experience. So I suppose uh, maybe he has a point here. But concurrency control strikes me as another major, uh, major reason. To, um, the, the best way in which you can handle concurrent access to the database is if you have a single, a single copy of the data in one place. So we have to live with this big delay, with a round trip, with a, TCP, with a slow TCP IP connection, and we're starting a thread whenever we contact the database. How can you do better? Did you have a? Uh, how can we how can we uh, reduce the impact of of this uh, connection cost? Think about we we are still within this framework OLTP. You can't say I'm going to read I'm going to do uh, group by queries because they touch a lot of data and then the throughput will be good. Yes. Batch processing. Uh, Batch processing, if, you, if you're running in a client-server architecture, then you still have the same problem. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, if batch processing might not be an option for certain applications. Yes? Separate the DSS database from OLTP. Uh, we, we definitely separate the DSS decision support database from OLTP. That's a good option. But the question is, how do we speed up the OLTP application? Remove the load from the DSS. <laughs> But that doesn't solve the latency problem. Yes. Uh, hashing, ca caching. Um, it's not that easy. I don't know how caching works between the server and the client. Um, the, the, the client is like, like your, um, your, your teller machine. And every time a customer comes, he needs to access a different account. So caching doesn't quite help. But what did you want to say? Oh, no, I was just saying that normally OLTP and decision support anyways, you never have them together in the same uh, environment. Uh, so yeah, really yeah we, we, we should fully agree on this. Uh, it's, it's a good design decision to keep the OLTP, uh, the, the, the database that, that ser serves as, the OL, as an OLTP database separate from the database that serves as a decision support database. So then you wonder, how can these be synchronized? How are they synchronized, by the way? How are these? Use a replica normally decision support. Sorry? Do you use a replica or use a, uh, or if you do load balancing, you keep one of the partitions, you keep a replica partition just for decision support. Right. So they are, they are replicated. Yes. Actually, I disagree. I think that decision support systems are shaped very differently than OLTP as well. So in a lot of instances, we've used detailed processes to actually transform things out of the OLTP. Right, but yeah. you need somewhere to read from in the first yes. place. So so that's that's right. You yes. first yes. use yes. a replica yes. in the warehouse. Yes. You Okay. Yeah, totally. Agree. Okay. So just to keep you updated, we have here a lively discussion about how this is done. 
Um, so normally what, 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 is, what is done is that the decision support is, is um, usually stored in a data warehouse. I'm going to write here DW, data warehouse. Uh, it's often a different schema, a different organization, and often a different database system that uh, runs a decision support system. And uh, the, the, the data is transferred from the OLTP database system to the, decision, to the data warehouse uh, on a regular basis, usually at night. Uh, or, or on a weekly basis. Uh, and it's, it's never completely up to date. And that's okay. And I, I don't know how many, but if I do, if I do my personal banking at, tw at 12, at midnight, it's often the, the, the system says, sorry, we are updating. I mean, <laughs> when, I, when am I supposed to do my personal banking? But that's, that's life. They, they, uh, they, um, you, what you see there is not the, it's not the OLTP it's not data from their, their production database, from their uh, OLTP database, but it's, it's a data from a copy. Good. But we still didn't, did, didn't answer the, the major question. We are, forget about decision support. Let me erase it. That's gone. Uh, we only have the OLTP database, and we uh, have a client, and this client needs to connect often uh, to the OLTP database uh, with these point accesses. Give me this record, update that record, uh, check if the balance is bigger than so and so, and if so, then do the transfer. Several connections just for, for a minor transfer. How can we improve this? Yes? Why would you have several connections? Usually you maintain one connection. First. But every time you need to do one of these actions, you need to, to send a SQL query. Yes, but you keep the same connection. That's just basic. Uh... Right. So there are tricks you can do as a connection level. You, you, can, open, you can keep the connection open. This means a single TCP connection. Uh, but you're still, you're still paying a, a relatively high uh, um, round trip overhead. And the solution is called stored procedures. Um, very little. Store, store procedures, they're essentially programs uh, that are written in some arcane language, which actually I, I, I never use and I, I don't know it, but they are stored on the database system. They live in that address space. So the idea is that you would uh, move some of the application logic from the, the, the address space of your client you move it to the OLTP system. Uh, a typical example is, where, uh, think about a transfer from one account to the other, right? You know the amount of money to be transferred. You know the account number of, of the first account and the account number of the second account. You all know all this. So now you need to do a simple application logic. Read the first account, check if the amount there is greater than what you need. Um, update it with a difference, read the second account, update it with the sum, that's it. Five accesses, uh, five accesses to the database, or five, five steps. Instead of having five uh, J JDBC or ODBC connection between the client and the server, you store this piece of code on the server, and then you call the stored procedure only once. And it will do, it will execute this, up, this application logic at, at the database server. And that is a significant saving. Now, this is, it's a good um, programming practice when you write applications to move uh, some of your application logic on the server. OK, but this only brings you so far. At some point, the database server will be swamped. So what does Mike Stonebreaker suggest that you can do if the database gets swamped? Yes. Uh, sharding, so split up the key space across multiple servers. Sharding, he mentioned this term. Sharding means this, uh, it, 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 it means um, horizontal partitioning, something we will talk about next time, partitioning. Uh, but the, the, the idea is very simple. Think about a table, it's long. Right, a, a very, very big table. You partition this horizontally. A typical example is uh, customers in Seattle, they will sit in this partition. 
customers in Bellevue, they will sit in that partition. And customers in, in New York, they will be in a different partition, in a different table. Now, sharding uh, is, uh, goes beyond that. Uh, in addition to the partition, sharding also means you store these partitions on different servers, and you often partition other tables uh, as well in order to, to isolate as much as possible access to just uh, uh, one single partition. That, that's the idea of in, in sharding. Uh, now, uh, database systems, they, um, apparently they don't support this idea of sharding very well, uh, but modern, modern ones like Greenplum uh, and he mentioned a couple of others, which I, I, I don't know. They, are, they, they do support sharding pretty, pretty well. Any, any comments so far? Did, any, did anybody use sharding in their, yeah? On, on what system? Uh, some stuff at Amazon in my previous job. Uh, basically started based on um, data that the client already had. So instead of going by a location which you don't know, you go by something you already have like an ID number. Okay, so so uh, he mentioned a, a, an application where he did sharding, uh, but not by location, but by an ID number, by different uh, criteria. Okay, so that's that's uh, one way in which you can improve your database performance. Uh, it won't get you too far, and there is a problem to here because traditional database systems like MySQL. Uh, they don't support, support sharding. You have to implement this in your, in your own application. Uh, I don't know about SQL Server. Uh, does support sharding? With some work, but yes. With some work, okay. So depending on how much you want to invest. However, these new startups, and I know about Greenplum because it um, has some connections to Berkeley, they do support, support sharding natively. Okay, but, but then he goes even deeper and he says, that if you look carefully at where the time goes in these uh, OLTP systems, where does a server spend its time? After you do the sharding, after you store, do the store procedure thing, why, do they, why, why, why does such a highly optimized database server still perform uh, um, worse than a key value, key value store? Where does this time go? Logging. He mentions four things, and let me see how I can do this. I'm going to raise everything. First thing is logging. And he talks about locking as well. Locking. The third, it's called latching. And the fourth is a buffer management. Logging. What is logging? It's something we, we are going to study in, in detail uh, two weeks from now. And uh, yes, it's writing data, writing everything that you're doing in the database, so that if something is corrupted or crashes, you can recover and replay. Exactly. That's be beautiful. Beautiful definition. Writing something in, in a specialized file called a log, such that if the system crashes, you should be able to recover the data when when you um, restart the system. Uh, it, it's a major source of inefficiency. Uh, in order for the logging to work, you must write, you must write ahead. It's, it's called the write ahead log. You can't postpone that write. You must force it to disk. When, when, when the time comes to do the, your, your logging action, you must force it to disk. And this accounts for, according to uh, some research paper that he, he, he cites, uh, accounts for 25% of, uh, of the time spent by the server. Quite insightful. Locking, what's locking? And actually, let me backtrack here. If you're using a key value store that doesn't do logging, bingo, you'll get re your, your performance improves by, by 25% just because of that. Do, uh, do key, key, value, key value stores use uh, logging, as far as you know? Uh, does, does yours do, do logging? Uh, Cassandra does most of its uh, initial stuff in memory, so it doesn't force writes to disk immediately. So okay. If, if, it's, if you lose the thing, the server that you inserted data into, you can lose some data. So uh, somebody in this room uh, has experience with Cassandra um, and a key value, uh, key, key value store. Uh, and he said that by default, it does not do logging. Um, but the, of course, then you don't get asset properties if you don't have logging. 
Locking. What is locking? That's easier. Lock the record before updating it. And read lock or write lock. Read lock or write lock whenever you're updating or even when you read. Uh, you need to, to, if you read a, a record and you want to read several records, you need to lock them so you don't allow others to update them so you get, because then you get a non-consistent view. Uh, same thing. If you don't care about concurrency control, then um, sure, you can get rid of locking. Now, latching is a more technical term. It has to deal with uh, how you lock indexes and the distinction why, uh, why, why do we have different te techniques is, is pretty subtle and I, I hope I hope we'll get to this when we talk about uh, um, the re recovery manager. But it's, it's the same spirit as locking. It's to ensure concurrency control. These two together are, are almost indistinguishable. Uh, and the last thing is a buffer manager. What is a buffer? It's, a, it's memory uh, where, you, uh, where you keep copies. It's a cache. The buffer is exactly a cache. It's a cache of pages from disk. And the reason why we need a buffer is because, well, the database is on disk. If it were a main memory database, you don't need a buffer. Yes? Well, you do. You put more than just uh, caches in there. You do stuff like uh, query plans and uh, temp tables, stuff like that. Uh, in, in, a, in a main memory database? Even there. Um, you can't put the query plan anywhere else. But there is no, no reason to, so the, 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 the purpose of the buffer is precisely to be, to be a cache between the disk and the, um, and the database system. Uh, if, if you were to implement, a, I, I don't have examples of uh, memory databases, but you can imagine that they, they, they get rid of the buffer. Uh, but let, let's discuss exactly what we mean by the buffer. Where does the time go? What happens, why does, how can 25% of, of the time go in the, uh, and managing the buffer. What exactly goes wrong here? The buffer we haven't discussed yet. We're going to discuss it two weeks from now. Uh, it consists of, of pages, of blocks. They are called blocks. And they have fixed lengths. Uh, and the data there is organized badly because it's organized as it has to be when you, when you store it on disk. So if you need to access a record, you need to do a little bit of parsing, essentially. You need to find that record and identify its, its attributes if the, rec if the records are of variable length, then you need to do some arithmetic to identify where the record is and where its attributes are. That adds to the overhead. Now, if you have a main memory database system, this can go away. Now your records are standard Java uh, objects or, or, um, or C++ ob objects. And you don't need to do this parsing at runtime in order to, uh, uh, to access your, your objects. So these are, uh, I found this quite interesting, quite insightful. This is where your time goes. If you turn all these things off, then yeah, you get to the same performance uh, as a key value, uh, key value store. Uh, but in, in many applications, you need the functionality that uh, uh, justified uh, one or all four of these, um, um, of these um, features. One other thing that he talks about is a single record transaction. Now, we didn't, uh, did we discuss transactions last time? We, we have three, three lectures for transactions, so don't worry, we'll, we'll get, you'll get the point. Uh, but we, we mentioned briefly what a transaction is. It's a set of, of operations that are uh, executed atomically. Now, if, if a transaction is a single record, it means that you can only update a single record, and that's what the transaction can guarantee. What happens if you want to transfer money from one account to, to another? Can you do this with a single, single record transaction? That's a typical example where you need to, you, you need to make sure that both, both accounts are updated in a consistent way. Uh, you, can't, you can't update one account and then say, well, now if the system crashes, I'm okay. And then you update the second account and say, if the system crashes now, I'm okay. No, you must ensure that both accounts are updated uh, in, in, a, in, in an atomic way. And, and the problem with these uh, um, key value stores is that they support only uh, single record transactions. And therefore, they will not support the more complicated application logic. 
Any other thoughts about uh, this blog? Yes? So you talked about sharding and talked about you know, one database system that's going to be supporting it better. And uh, we have a fellow here who suggests that it's painful to do on uh, MS SQL. Uh, and so I, I just say that the, the NoSQL things seem to still have a, a very reasonable place for you know something that's you need the, the parallelism because you just can't do that with the, the main database systems now. So I mean, certainly not the same, and certainly you wouldn't apply the same workloads. But he, I don't know. He seemed to be kind of dissenting of NoSQL in a way that I thought was a little too harsh because the main system still support some of the stuff that you need to get the load down. Yeah. So the the point that your colleague made is that. Uh, that, that currently there are no database systems available that that do this that that support the sharding that you need to do for in order to scale up to large uh, volumes of data uh, that support sharding out of the box. And he does mention some some startups that that offer such database systems, but come on, they are not they are not widely available. So your colleague has this point that uh, there is a clear role for the NoSQL database uh, databases out there uh, to. Um, they, sh they, they scale up to la much larger collections of, of um, data than standard database systems. Uh, well, this is Mike Stonebreaker. He, he wants to be controversial, um, and uh, maybe we can discuss other of his controversial statements. Uh, I, I didn't see, I didn't see, I, I, I missed the controversial tone in, in this blog, perhaps because I, I was expecting more controversial statements. Um, but anyway, I suppose we, we all get uh, we all get the idea. Uh, NoSQL databases they ha offer very limited functionality. Uh, if you can, if you know for sure your application can uh, will only need that functionality, then you can go with them. If you need anything extra, then start with a relational database system. And any any more comments? Okay, good. So uh, this took me much longer than I thought. But I think it was a great discussion. Um, how do I go back? So um, for today, we uh, we discussed two uh, parts of the conceptual design activity: how to uh, design uh, entity relationship diagrams and how to convert them into relations. And then we will discuss traditional normalization theory: how to make uh, the design. Uh, and how to how to make sure that the design avoids anomalies. Uh, so let me go a little bit faster over the database design. Uh, the idea is here that you, when you first start a project that needs a database, you need to figure out what goes into that database. What are the objects? And another terminology for the objects are entities. That is the old terminology for objects, and we are stuck with this in, in the database world. Entities. Uh, what are their attributes, and how, they, how do they relate to each other? Then you need to document this somehow before you create tables. You need to be able to document this. And uh, this is done uh, in some diagrams. They are called entity relationship diagrams. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you now. Uh, these diagrams, they talk about uh, three things. They talk about entities. These are objects. Col collections of similar entities are called entity sets. Think of them as classes. Uh, and th this, is the, this is one thing, entity sets. Then we have attributes. Uh, and then we have relationships. So uh, let me start with a simple example. Suppose you need to design a database that um, maintains information about products, about the companies that make these products, and about people, uh, and these people, they, they can be either um, employees at these companies or maybe they, they are customers of these products. They, are, they serve a double, double role. And these are, these are the three in types of objects. These are the three classes or the, the, the three entity sets that you need to store. The next thing you need to worry about the attributes. What are their attributes? Well, you know how to get there. You just need to find out what, what attributes each object needs to have. And you add them, and now your design looks like this. Uh, you need to decide for every entity set, uh, uh, for, uh, you need to decide which attribute is a key. In this formalism of entity relationship diagrams, every entity set must have a key, and you underline it. 
Uh, and sometimes if I forget a key, remember it has, to, it has actually has to be there. And finally, you need to design the relationships between uh, the entity sets. For example, makes is a relationship that tells us which product made what, uh, was made by what company. Okay. So where are the tables here? How many tables would you have to create in SQL to implement this uh, entity relationship diagram? Well, let's take it slowly. Uh, how would you implement product in SQL? Have a table with those three columns. That's exactly. Create a table called product, and it will have three three columns, which are these three attributes. Uh, ob obviously, the same thing for for a company, right? You create a table called company with with two attributes. But now makes. It's supposed to tell us uh, which product made, is made by what company, yes? Well, so can a product be made by another one company then? Uh, let's say no. no. Let's suppose uh, uh, the same product can be made it's like a um, commodity product, uh, flour. Okay, you can, it's made by several companies. So how, how, how can we implement mix? If a link table about the product company, for instance, that says who makes which product. So what do you, what, you what's have a link table, a link table is called a uh, product company, uh, for instance, and it's got uh, warranties to the uh, key of the company and product. Exactly. With another table. He called it a link table, but I would call it a table. It's going to be a third table uh, called makes. Now, what are its attributes? How many attributes do we need in this table? Two. Uh, one is a product ID. And the other is name. You've seen this, right? If you if you did if you did the homework, you definitely saw this. What was the name of the relationship? Cast. Okay, so this is an entity relationship diagram. Uh, now let's look a little bit uh, deeper. So I already mentioned this. Every entity set must have an, a key. Uh, what happens if we underline two? Attributes. What does it mean? Composite. It's a composite key. What happens if you want to have two separate keys? If you want to uh, be able to identify an entity set either by this attribute or by that attribute, both both can serve as a key. You can't do this. An entity relationship and in SQL as well, you can only have a single key per uh, table. You can index it. You, 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 can, you can say it's unique, or you can create an index, but if you create an index, it doesn't mean it's unique. Okay, uh, so these are the entity sets. Um, let's look a little bit deeper at relationships. Uh, relationships are just mathematical relations. Now, a relation, if you remember from algebra, or from, from set theory, uh, is defined as follows. Uh, if you take two sets, A and B, then their Cartesian product, which is this, represents a set of, of pairs, one, one element from A and one element from B. That's a Cartesian product. A relation is just a subset of this Cartesian product. So this is R, it's any subset. Uh, and we often represent this with, with edges. So we put A on the left and we put B on the right. And then every time a pair is in the relation R, we add an edge. Like here. This is a this is a relation. Uh, relationships in ER diagrams are exactly relations, are exactly mathematical relations. For example, mix. It's just a set of, of pairs of product company pairs. That's how you should think about this. Now here are here is an interesting definition. A relation is called one to one. <coughs> If, um, if every element on the left connects to at most one element on the right, and every element on the right connects to at most one element on the left, then it's called one to one. Uh, it's called many one uh, if, well, if every element on the right connects to at most one, uh, two, no, what did I say? 
is when every element on the left connects to at most one element on the right. And it's called many many if none of the above happens. And of course, we can also have one many. In ER diagrams, we represent these relations with arrows. We add these arrows. Okay, and it's very handy in, in expressing certain constraints in the data. Let me show you an example. Uh, before the example, I should uh, point out that different um, people use different conventions to represent uh, um, one, many to one or um, one to one um, um, relationships. And also the, the notations for, uh, for, for the entity sets and for the relationships, uh, the, 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 the things that the, the rectangles and the diamonds, uh, it's interesting, they are standard in textbooks. All the textbooks use uh, rectangles and diamonds, but none of the commercial systems use rectangles and diamonds. Uh, they use different um, representations. Uh, so then don't get too much uh, attached to uh, these notations. They are standard in academia and in uh, textbooks, uh, but feel free to recognize uh, ER diagrams in any other format. Uh, in particular, our book um, decided to move the arrow from here and put the arrow here. I think it makes more sense the way the book does it. Uh, but uh, most, most books just place the arrow here, and I'm going to use that notation on the slide. Good, so let's see how we can use many, many relationships. Now I, I, I made makes a uh, um, many to one relationship. What does it mean? Many what? products are manufactured by one single company. Uh, yes, but you, 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 um, but you said it's correct, but it's not, it's not enlightening. <laughs> I, I don't get it, yes? You don't need the link table anymore. Uh, that's true, but it's deeper than I want. You can add a column to the person uh, table. Yeah, that, that's what he said. But what does it mean? What am I saying about my products product. and my companies? Yes. One product can be made only by one uh, company? Exactly. Uh, if you look at the product, that product can be made only by one company. That's what I'm saying. So no more flour and butter and milk. Uh, you can't, if you have milk, milk is probably made by several farms, by several companies. No, no more. Now we have a different database in which a product is made. Uh, think about Apple and iPod and, and um, um, net, Netbook. Uh, everything is made by a single company. You, you're not happy. No, no. Did, did you have a question? No, we still need the makes table because a company could make multiple products. <coughs> Sorry? If I a company make more than one product? A company can, uh, so good question. Let's see, let turn this into a question. In this design, can a company make more than one product? Yes. Yes. It's many to one. Yes, because it's many to one. So having a foreign key in the company to product wouldn't work then, right? Oh, no, you got so having a foreign key in company to product would not work. But what would work? A foreign key to company in product. If you put a foreign key in product to company. And we, we I have a more detailed slides about this. Uh, what about this arrow? What does it say? A person can be employed by only one company. A, a can be by only one company. <coughs> right? If we, would, if we don't put that arrow, it means that a person maybe consults for multiple companies or works for multiple companies. Uh, but if we put the arrow, then we insist that a person works for only one company. What about, uh, uh, can we store customers in this table that don't work for any company? Uh, in, in this design, I, I said table, but uh, the correct term is design. Uh, can you have a, a, a person that you, you want to add to the database, you want to insert in the database because he's a customer? If that's not a foreign key. No. But, but the question is, so don't, don't think about the implementation. Don't think about the, tab the, uh, the tab table statement yet. Think about the ER diagram. What do you think does the arrow mean? There should be a company for every person. So if a person is a customer who does not have a company, then he cannot be there in the person. No, 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 it's actually incorrect. It's, it's the opposite. Uh, we can have a person that uh, doesn't work for any company. The arrow means every person must work for zero or one companies. 
And if you, if you get confused, and you can go back to this slide, which I'm going to make clearer, cleaner. Uh, you can see this, for example, here. You don't see it on the left, but you see it on the right. Right? Uh, B has no matching element uh, on the other side. So, one question. Are we missing one diagram here? We have many to one, but not one to many. Yeah. Yeah, we are missing the symmetric to uh, one to many. Okay, so I think we, we, we have get a better intuition of um, the arrows. Uh, multi-way uh, multi relationships. What does purchase mean in this case? It associates a product, a store, a person, and it has a date attribute. What does it mean? A purchase consists of a triple, of uh, a product that was purchased, a store where it was sold, and a person who bought it. So if you were to implement purchase in SQL, uh, you, you need to create a table with how many attributes and what kind of attributes? Four. Yes, three keys and one column. Exactly. We need four attributes. One, uh, the, the key from products, the key from persons, the key from store, and the date when that purchase happened. Okay, so this is multi-way relationship. Now, uh, we don't need multi-way relationships. We can always uh, reify them. That's a term that sometimes used in graph theory. Uh, we can replace purchase with a new entity set. And then it looks like this. Now we have, uh, we have promoted purchase from what it was a relationship. We have promoted it to an entity set. Uh, but now we need to, to rec record for every purchase, it's the product, the store, and the person, where that purchase happened. Now, do you follow this? Because now I have a subtle question. This design misses arrows. Whenever we convert from a multi-way relationship to several binary relationships, we need to add arrows. Which arrows do we need to add? Let's look at product of. Should I put the arrow here, the red arrow, or should I put the arrow here, the blue arrow? So think about it this way, a purchase. Is it the case that a purchase has a single product? Or is it, is it the case that a, a product has a single corresponding purchase? Neither. But what is a purchase? How do you think about a purchase? We just discussed it. It's a. It's a sort of unique. Yeah, it's a single transaction. So I think the warranty goes on for just pointing at product. So, so which yeah. which color? The blue one. I think. The blue one. Yeah, that's the answer. Oops. Let me put the blue back. Think about it this way: a purchase consists. It's it's a record. It's a tuple that has uh, the product ID the store ID, and the person social security number. And it has a date. That is what a purchase is. So clearly, if you, if you look at the purchase, there is a unique product, which you just read. It's just right here. So a purchase corresponds to a unique product. OK. Um, some, some more um, fun thoughts about design. What's wrong with the first design? The person can only buy one product. A person can only buy one, only one product. That would increase the savings rate a lot. Right, so we, we probably don't want this arrow. Uh, what's, what's, what's wrong about the second design? You can have, uh, you can be president of several countries while uh, the country has several presidents. Yeah. That so it works if you're a board of director or something. <laughs> if you're board of director, can you, can you be president of, uh, but this is well, really country. You can be on several boards and uh, the boards contain several people. Okay, so we have, we have a creative, um, um, we have from, from this room a creative um, uh, proposal for how to make sense out of this design. So instead of countries, think about companies. And uh, now instead of president, we have, that's a CEO. CEO, 
So yeah, a person can be a, a president of several companies and the company might have several presidents. But when it comes to countries, that's not true. How would you design this better? Where would you put arrows? Both ends. Both ends. That's what I put. With. A country can have only one president, and the president is the president for only one company. However, if you actually think, think deeper, uh, it's not so clear. One of these arrows is not so clear. Yes. So across time, uh, countries have multiple presidents. Exactly. If you if you want a historical database, if you want if this database is a snapshot of today's presidents, then you need both arrows. But if you want a historical database, and of course a, 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 a country over time has multiple presidents. Yes. So a couple slides back, we implied a one-to-one -one relationship between two records, where but it allows for sort of that, that nullness of one or the other of it. Yeah. You can have a constraint that says not null for that foreign key. Is there any way to represent that uh, kind of, there's got to be one of each of these in the diagram in language? Right. So let me repeat the question for, for uh, people in the, uh, at Microsoft. So uh, in, in, uh, in, um, as a, in SQL, you can always declare that a foreign key is not null. And you can enforce that every uh, entity from from the left has e exactly one matching entity on the right. How can you do this in ER diagrams? And you can do this by replacing arrow with uh, with uh, with a uh, with this sign. I have it later on with a semicircle. That's a convention, and probably different conventions. You might find different conventions in other places. Okay, more uh, fun with design. What's wrong here? Uh, it's, it's, it's just our standard purchase between store and product, uh, and we just re record, um, in addition to the date, also the, the name and address of the person who made the purchase. We don't store what he purchased? Uh, we store what he purchased right, right here. What's wrong with this? Yes? You've got to repeat yourself a lot because a person can purchase many products, but you're going to re-encode that every time. Exactly. A person may purchase multiple products. If you use this design, then you need to repeat that, the information about that person over and over again every time he purchases a product. Yes? It may actually make sense given that uh, these things are over time and you're looking for possible historical data. But, you know, that's maybe a different discussion. Uh, I, I, I think I, I, I find a lot of arguments in, in favor of uh, um, storing people in a persons in a separate uh, table in a separate relation. Uh, even if you collect some, the, the, what goes wrong is that uh, when the first when, when the, the customer buys a product for the first time, you don't have it in that table, and then of course you you, you don't want to turn him turn, turn him away. Uh, so you need to insert him on the fly, and maybe then you don't have all the information. So you need to, to make some decisions. But there is a lot of value of consolidating these, these customers in a, in a common table. So it worth, it's worth to go through the effort and create just this um, person. And now you have uh, a three-way relationship. OK, and last one. What's wrong with this? Here I did it. I really did the right thing. I put person in a separate entity. Says so. Is there anything wrong? Dates. The dates. Don't overdo it. Right. The dates. They, they make no sense. They they're just strings. It doesn't make sense to have a separate entity set for a separate relation of dates. You you look unhappy. You would store them as separate table. I'm just like, why would he even? That's just. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the purpose of the slides, to make you um, object. Good. So this, this was basic uh, uh, ER diagram design. And we touched upon this, this question, how do we actually map the ER diagram into SQL tables? Now I'm going to go a little bit uh, in more detail, but I'm not going to go too slowly, because we, we already uh, got the main idea. So the, um, the first task is to convert every entity set into a relation, into a table. And uh, here it is. 
you uh, an entity set called product is converted into a table called product uh, with exactly the attribute that you see there. Really, no surprises here. In SQL, the command for creating a table uh, is it's this, it's create table. And after that, you list the, the, the name of the table. And inside, you list uh, the, the attributes. In this case, there are three attributes. And look how we declare the key. After product ID, we say that's a primary key. OK, any questions about the create table statement? OK. The next task is to uh, uh, represent relationships, shipment. So a shipment, we discussed this. Uh, a shipment will, will correspond to, uh, a shipment will be implemented by a relation, uh, by a table, uh, that has uh, the key from the left, the key from the right, and its own uh, attributes. So here they are, the key from the left, the key from the right, and its own attribute. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, so let's see the create, st create table statement. It's right here. Uh, we have, this is the key from the right. Uh, this is a key from the left. And here is a date. Now, what is references? What does this mean? Key. It's a foreign key. References says that name is a foreign key to the shipping company, to the table on, on the right. Uh, but the other two, they are, are they also form a foreign key. How do we say that? Well, we, can't, we can't say it after the, the attribute because there are two. So we list them at the end, right here. So the, we say here that the peer product ID and customer ID they together form a foreign key into orders. Nothing deep here, it's just syntax. Notice that the primary key consists only of the keys. It does not consist of the date. And that is a convention in ER diagrams. And a relationship is, unique, uh, is uniquely defined by the, entity, uh, by the entities that it connects. And uh, they, they form a key. You do, you do not include the attribute as part of the key. That's, that's a convention in ER diagrams. If you want the attribute as part of the key, then you, you uh, make that in an entity set and create binary relationships. Any questions about this slide? OK. Um, how do we represent this purchase? I think we discussed this, right? So I'm going to skip it. Um, more um, more um, features in ER diagrams, classes and uh, subclasses and inheritance. Inherit, inheritance. Uh, and the example I'm going to use to, to um, illustrate inheritance is that of an entity set called product and two other entity sets called software products and educational products. And the idea is that a software product is going to be a subclass of products. It's going to have extra attributes. So uh, in ER diagrams, um, the sign is this triangle where we write is a. So we say that the software product is a product. So what does this exactly mean? If you look at the software product, how many attributes does it have? Four. So it, it inherits the three attributes of product. And in addition, it has its own product called, its own uh, attribute called platforms. How would you implement this? Clearly, we create a table for product, but what, what, uh, how do you implement software products? Yes? Because each one only has one vector attribute, I would put them all in one table and have a type column. Switch off that. I see. So you would hack it. <laughs> Uh, but what about a very clean design? Think about a database system that doesn't understand nulls. So it doesn't allow you to put any nulls. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an idealized relational database system that's really based on mathematical logic, no nulls. 
Yes. Just pick a, another table that's the software product where the key is the foreign key of the product and then it just adds platforms is another column. Yes. So we create a new table called software products. And the interesting question is what attributes do we have? And you mentioned a foreign key into product. That's, that would be the name. And what other information do we have? Platforms. Just the platforms. That's what we need. Yes? You could also do something where you uh, model the subclasses as uh, basically additional attributes. And then um, the product has a emphasis essentially a class ID, which tells the uh, database which attributes are allowed. And then you have an attribute table that you know, lists this off, uh, you know, attribute value, attribute value. Sure, so you can, you can do this, this is what he proposed. But then if, if you have a record that is of the wrong class and you need null, null values, I mean, for every record. It doesn't have null values, it just has lots of records for a given product. Well, then I don't, oh, I see, because you, you're essentially partitioning uh, the, the record into uh, separate, you partition the table vertically, one for, well, yeah, I mean, once for every, um, every attribute. If you have a great many uh, varieties of products, that might be a good idea. Yep. Let's actually discuss this. It's an interesting thought. Let me show you uh, the design that I would like everyone to uh, understand and, and use on the homework. Uh, it's like it's a baseline uh, design. And then we can discuss variations. So the, the design that I would like you to remember is this. There is one table for product, uh, which contains exactly the attributes that you see here in the entity relationship diagram. Uh, and then there is an, another table for software product that has two interesting things. It has a foreign key, and it has uh, the, this extra attribute for platform. Let me use screen platforms. And then there is uh, the educational product uh, that also has a foreign key, and it has its own uh, uh, its own special attributes called age group. Does it make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Now, the, the, what, what your colleague proposed is that you can push this idea even further. You could create a separate table for every attribute. That's called vertical partitioning. And sometimes it makes sense. Uh, sometimes it makes sense, especially if the application accesses only one attribute at a time. Uh, it makes much less sense if you need to join, if you need to access multiple attributes uh, at the same time. So it's, it's a design choice, and it was a, <clears throat> a trend in database systems recently um, when um, essentially Mike Stonebreaker's group uh, reinvented uh, column-wise organization of databases, and that was another scandal because <coughs> he didn't invent this, but he essentially reinvented and popularized, popularized the idea. And the idea, again, is to take a, a table with many attributes and store, uh, store it in, uh, in separate tables, one for each attribute. And that speeds up certain query workloads. Yes? In the same vein, uh, doesn't this design make it more difficult to do kind of aggregate queries that compare software products and educational products? Because you have to do joining? Absolutely. So this design, uh, it's very elegant. Uh, I hope you, uh, you see the, it's, it's elegant. But uh, if you need to, to compare, um, Whenever you have a, a query over software products that needs to touch both the platform and, let's say, the category, then you need to join. They do not sit in the same, in the same table. Yes? Even, if, even worse than that, it'd be doing kind of decision support kind of stuff that involves the various types of products, and it has limitations on platforms and age groups and products. So it gets much more complicated if it's split out this way. Um, OK, so I, I, I take this criticism. Uh, did we discuss about data independence? We, we did not discuss this. Uh, I, I, I'll take this back. Um, so take, take this design as uh, you know, the, the, the lecturer's recommendation for the design of this database. You can consider others as well. But for the purpose of the second homework, please use this design. This simplifies um, grading. And we'll, we'll come back to the, to the data independence principle. Uh, I want to show you a cute application of, uh, of um, inheritance. How do you model union types? Uh, a union type is essentially is a, is, a, uh, is a type that consists of the union of two different types. You want to put them together in the same, the same type. And the example here 
is that uh, we have three entity sets. Uh, persons, we have companies, and every f piece of furniture uh, belongs belongs either to a person or to a company. Uh, how do we say this? How do we represent in an ER diagram that every piece of furniture belongs to a person or to a company? Or you could make a sub uh, base class owner of furniture. And exactly. That's, that's, that's how, how, how we would like to do it. We would like to create an owner um, entity set that consists of all the persons or companies put together. Now they are owners, they are the same thing. This is a union type. But be before we get there, there is a simpler choice. Now we, we can have, we can say, look, the piece of furniture is owned uh, by a person. But that's not enough, no. We also need to allow this to be owned by by a company, so this would be own, uh, own two. But this design is somewhat unsatisfactory. What, what's, what is this missing? No, no, it, it, it just, it, it allows us to represent things that we don't want to uh, represent. It allows multiple owners, one of each type. Exactly, they can say this chair belongs to this person and to that company. Um, well, bad, bad design, that's, that's what we, yeah. You could hack it with a trigger that requires at least a little email. Sure, sure, you can hack things away. But the, the, before we hack it, uh, let's, let's come up with the cleanest design. And the, the, the design that, um, that, that I want to show you is with this union type. So this is, this is what we, you saw. Uh, the union type defines a new, a new, uh, a new entity set called the owner. And owners are all the companies and all, all, all the persons. It makes sense if you're using them in, in a unified way as owners of furniture, why not create a new entity set that represents all the owners? And then every person is an owner and every company is an owner. And now you can simply say that a piece of furniture is owned by a single owner. Yeah, this is a kind of design that allows us to express exactly what we wanted. Okay, um, I still have, uh, how many slides do I have until we reach a normalization theory? I think it's a good time to take a break. Okay, so let's take a five minute break, not longer. And then uh, we still have to cover, um, I think we should be able to finish tonight uh, covering uh, the boys called normal form. It's not that hard. So a short five minute break, five minute, five minutes break. Okay, good time to start. Uh, so let's finish ER diagrams. I only have a few things to show you, namely constraints and then we can entity sets. So constraints, um, constraints are uh, statements, uh, they are essentially logical statements that must hold uh, at, at all times uh, on a database instance. Uh, and we need to be, uh, they, they, they are part of the database design, we need to be aware of what they are. And many, of, many types of constraints can be represented either in ER diagrams or in SQL or in both. Uh, and we will discuss constraints both in ER diagrams, it takes us five minutes, uh, and later in SQL. So uh, the constraints are um, of, a few of several types. Key constraints, you know what they are, I'm not going to spend time. Single value constraints, this is the um, uh, arrow. Uh, referential integrity constraints, this is whether we allow nulls or not, that's uh, in, a, in a foreign key. And then uh, more complicated constraints. So let me go quickly, keys. We have seen key constraints. I have nothing else to add. We discuss this. Um, single value constraints are the arrows on an, uh, ER diagrams. If we put an arrow, it means that uh, that the the object on the other side can have a, uh, only one value uh, on, on on the opposite side of the relationship. 
referential integrity uh, essentially means that uh, the, the value must refer to an existing object. So uh, this, is a, this is a way in which we enforce that a product is made by exactly one company. And the way to, to think about this operationally, I mean, um, um, uh, at the implementation level, is that if you have a foreign key from product into company, that, uh, that foreign key cannot be null. That is referential integrity. It must refer to an existing object. Uh, and finally, uh, there are more complicated constraints that, depending on what formalism you're reading for ER diagrams, you might or might not be able to represent. What does it say? What do you think? Check constraint. Uh, it, it's, it's, so this thing here, less than 100, what do you think says? What can it say? Less than 100 products are made by that company. Yeah. Uh, less than 100 products are made by every company. It's much harder to enforce in SQL, but if, you want, if this is what you want to enforce, there is a way in which you can do this in SQL with a general assert uh, statement. Okay, the last thing, uh, all the books mention them, I need to mention it as well. Uh, called, they are called weak entity sets. And the idea is that sometimes uh, you don't have uh, enough information to, to have a key for your entity set. Instead, you need to borrow one from another entity set to which you have a, a many one relationship. Uh, and the example I'm using is uh, uh, one with uh, universities and teams. Uh, maybe you have um, teams uh, that have number. Uh, you have a um, squash team, and there is squash team number one, squash team number two, squash team number three. So uh, the only way you can identify teams is, is by their number. But now if you look at a different university, they, they also have a squash team number one, squash team number two, and so on. So you need more information to have a, a key for the team. So th that information comes from here, from the university. So the definition of a weak entity set is that its, its key consists of uh, its own key plus a key of all the entities uh, to which it refers through a uh, weak relationship. So how would you represent this? How would we, clearly we have a table for university, uh, but how would, how would we represent team? How many attributes do we store in team? Three, right? We need a sport, we need a team number, but we also need the name of the university. So we need three uh, attributes, yes? Wouldn't you then want to use the circle thing on the university instead of the arrow? Uh, let me raise because I, do, I put too many things. So why did I use a? Wouldn't you want to use the circle, half circle thing instead of the arrow? Ah, to have this. That means it's an attribute. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, uh, half, 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 half. So the semicircle instead the of this ah, here? this one here. Yeah. Uh, you're right. It makes sense. But uh, every book uses an, uh, the other, other arrow. And I, it's probably hardwired in the semantics of the weak entity set. Notice these two lines. They're important. That, this is an important information. It says, this is the relationship you need to follow in order to get the key. And uh, it's probably hardwired. Again, this depends on what, uh, what conventions you adopt for ER diagrams. Uh, but the convention here is that uh, whenever you have a weak entity set, then it means that the arrow is actually the circle. OK, uh, so I have a fun question for you. If you so are, are weak entity sets clear? Because if they're clear, then I have this. Uh, uh, big question for you. Um, here are some weak entity sets. And my question is, you look at R, and you have to tell me what are the keys of R. So I'm going to list them here. A is part of the key. What else would you include in, in the key? C, 
uh, you're far too faster than I am. So you go this way and then you get to C, right? What else? D. D, because from here we go this way and we get to D. Sorry? H. H, because we also follow this way and get the T sets, we get to H. <coughs> what else? Uh, e and F, because we go this way, we get to F, and then we also get here, and so E and F. Uh, because we can also go this way, and we get K. What about uh, L and G? No, we don't get L and G, because this is not a weak relationship. Okay, this is why the example is a little bit tricky. So we only follow the weak uh, relationships, we don't follow the standard relationships. Good. And this finishes uh, my discussion of um, entity relationship diagrams. Yes. Does that mean that all those weak entities such in the previous slide will have the same keys? Because oh, will they have the same keys? Good question. Uh, what about S? What are the keys of S? Um, H, K, and F, E. A H, is that? It? Yes, H, K. K, F, E. Yes. A, C. Nope. No A. No A because, let me erase, the arrow is also important. You only follow the arrow in one direction. So good question. What are the keys of S? Well, here they are. They are H, K, F, and E, and that's it. But normally for the database like this, we would take L as well. Just no, if you want L, L then you need, if you want to take L, then you need to do, to draw it like this. You need to make no. this re a relationship a weak. Uh, but for a many-to-one relationship, we usually have L in the S database. They have different amount. So the question is, if, if uh, why don't we take L as uh, as part of the key? And we don't take it because of of this convention of uh, how we represent uh, uh, relationships. If we, if we represent them with two lines, then the keys are borrowed from the other side. If it's with a single line, then, then they are standard relationships and there are no keys borrowed. Okay, any more questions? Um, please look at this at home and let, let me know next time if you still have... It's a, it's a relatively simple example. Um, once you get the logic, it's, it's obvious. Good, and now we get to the most uh, mathematical, if you want, the most formal part of uh, the entire course, essentially, uh, which is called design theory, which was developed in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and it's very uh, widely used today in, in every database uh, design. It's how to make sure that um, the database design doesn't have so-called uh, update anomalies. Uh, so let's go through this. Um, the, the idea is that once you finish your uh, base design of a database schema, once you finish your ER diagram and translate them into tables, uh, the resulting design is not good. Uh, it has some problems. In order to make it good, you need to uh, transform it. Uh, and uh, depending on how you transform it, you get to the, uh, one of, the, of several so-called normal forms. And these have been um, in, um, introduced historically at different times, and sometimes they represent different things. The first normal form uh, is completely different, different from the others, and it says that all relations are flat. Uh, the second normal form, forget it. It's obsolete. Nobody discusses it anymore. Uh, the, the normal form that we will study today is, is called the boys code normal form. And there is another one that's very popular. It's called the subnormal form. Uh, and I'm not going to discuss it in class because it's much more, it's, it's, it's more messy in some, in some sense, more difficult. And for practical purposes, it doesn't make such a big difference uh, from the boys code normal form. Uh, the book has a good treatment of the third normal form. So you can, you can read from, from the book. So I'm going to go over the first normal form in one slide and then spend the rest of the lecture on the boys code normal form. What does the first normal form do, uh, say? It says you should not have nested tables. 
That's what it says. If you want a table like this, uh, where for every student, you, what you want to do here is you want to say, for every student, I want a, a, a nested table in, inside the record representing that student that gives me all the courses. Why can't I have it? Well, you, you don't need it. You can always represent this, this information by flattening, by uh, transforming it into a first normal form where the student is one table, the courses are in another table, and then what do we have in between? A relationship. A many, many relationship, which is called takes. And that is the, the right design. Um, everybody follows the first normal form. Um, uh, all, all tables are, are flat. Now, in, in today's... Um, 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 SQL systems, you can also represent nested relations. And there was a, a lot of uh, theory work essentially at the end, in, end of the 80s and early 90s on how to extend query languages to deal with nested relations. But as a matter of design, it's a much better design if you uh, start with the first normal form in, in the flat tables. Good. Uh, so the, the, uh, the boys code normal form uh, is much more difficult. What it does is that it starts from the relational schema that you obtain from your ER diagram. Uh, and it will identify certain bad things that happen to the schema. And it will split the tables in, uh, vertically. It will do some vertical partition of the tables. And then the result is, is, is a much better design. And that's called the voice code normal form design. So what's, what's wrong? What can be wrong with a, with a schema? Well, uh, three things can go wrong. They're actually related. They're called data anom anomalies. And they are very popular today in, 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 among database practitioners. Um, um, they're called redundancy anomaly, update anomalies, and delete anomalies. So let's see them. And I'm going to, to go, we're going to go a little bit slower over this example. I think it's Really, it's, a, it's an important concept that I'd, I'd like you to uh, take away from, from today's lecture. Um, this is a table where we store uh, people, uh, their social security number, their phone number, and their city. And it's a great table. Uh, what's wrong with it? Uh, we have a name, we have a social security number, we have a phone number, and we have a city. Uh, now, of course, some people have two phones, like Fred. And that's okay. We store Fred twice in the table because he has two phone numbers. But this design exhibits all three anomalies. They're actually, these three anomalies are not so distinct. They're facets of the same problem. These three anomalies are re re redundancy. Data is repeated. Which, which data is repeated here? Fred. The, the city. This is important. This is, tells you where Fred lives. Okay, and it tells you twice that Fred lives in Seattle, which means you can get it wrong. You can place Fred in, in, in two different cities just because he has two phone numbers. Uh, so it's, it's a, a, a redundancy anomaly. Um, update anomalies. As a consequence of this, re of this redundancy anomaly, if Fred moves to, to, to Bellevue, what do you need to do to move Fred to Bellevue? Both you need to update both, both records. What happens if, you, if your application has a bug and uh, only updates one of the records? Then you're in trouble, right? Uh, you assume that every person lives in one city. That's what you assume, that every, every person lives in a single city. But now, because of your bug in the application, um, Fred suddenly lives in two cities. That's the uh, update anomaly. The deletion anomaly. Um, Joe, who is ahead of us, doesn't use a phone anymore. He uses only email address. So how can you, de how can you delete the phone number of Joe? No nulls, please. Uh, you can set a null, but no nulls, please. No, not, you're not allowed to use nulls. How do, you do, how do you delete a phone number? How do you de delete a phone number for Fred? You just remove that record. How do you delete Joe's phone, phone number? 
You just delete it. But now what happens? What is the anomaly? We don't have Joe anymore. That's a delete anomaly. You wanted to delete just a phone number, but you've ended up losing uh, more information. Okay, you know how to do it better. How would you design this table better? So place uh, SSN and and city and one table and Uh, okay, so we also place name. Ah, so again, SSN name in one table. What where, where do I place it? <coughs> I put place it in the same table, and this would be one table. Say table T one. And then in the table T two, place SSN and phone number. That's a much better design. In this way, uh, since SSN will be a key, every person lives in one city. And if you want multiple phone numbers or no phone, no phone, no phone number at all, you can have as many phone numbers or as few as you wish. Okay, That is a much better design. It's right here. Uh, and we, are, we get there by decomposing the table into two into this T1 and this T2. Now notice that in here, and the first one, SSN is a key, but in the second one, SSN is not a key, right? Because we emphatically wanted to allow a person to have multiple phone numbers. Here the key consists of, of both uh, attributes, SSN and phone, and phone numbers. Just to make sure, all three anomalies have disappeared. There is no more re repeated information about where Fred lives. Fred lives in, 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 in Seattle, and that's it. That's all we record. Um, if we want to move Fred to Bellevue, you just move him to Bellevue. It's a single update. And if, if we want to delete Joe's uh, phone number, you do this. You delete one record from here. And we don't lose the other information about Joe. So the question we are going to address is, how do we get from the top design to the bottom design? What was wrong about the top design uh, that we didn't, that caused us to get to the bottom design? And essentially what, what was wrong there is, was that um, um, every person must had, had to live in a single city. But here we had the city repeated. So, but every person had to live in a single city. That was the essence of that anomaly. Uh, and this is explained uh, with a beautiful theory, which is a theory of functional dependencies. Uh, um, and um, that's what I'm going to show you next. So a, f uh, a functional dependency is a constraint. It's a statement about, uh, it's, it's a statement about what should hold in the data. It's a particular constraint. The, the um, the precise definition is here, so let's look uh, carefully. A functional dependency is written like this, and it says that some attributes functionally determine other attributes. The A attributes in this case functionally determine the B attributes. What does it mean when we say that in a table the, the A attributes must functionally determine the B attributes? What do we mean by this? Uh, if, you if, if A is a key, then this functional dependency always holds. But we, we, we will look especially carefully at functional dependencies where A is not a key. So here is what it means. It means that if you have two tuples, uh, so suppose A is not a key. It means that if you find two tuples that have the same value for A, then they must have the same value for B as well. And that is written mathematically here. So it says that for any two tuples in the relation, if these two tuples agree on all the A's, if, if, 
if t a1 is equal to t prime a1 uh, and so on and t a m is equal to t prime a, a m then these tuples they must also agree on the b's that is a definition of a functional dependency now going back to our um, going back here can you can you give me an example of a functional dependency yes Name social security. Say again. Name social security number. Um, or where, where do you, social security number and city. Where, where do you put the, the arrow? Uh, between name and social security number and Yes. Uh, actually, even simpler. Here is a functional dependency. I hope you're you're with me. The associated your written number functionally determines the city. Social security number is not a key. Look, it occurs twice. But the two tuples where they agree, they also agree on the city. And it's actually a statement that we're making, that every social security number, which essentially means every person, uh, must be in a single city. It's a constraint that is part of our application. It's, a, it's part of the information that we need to identify when we design the database schema. Good. So uh, let me go back to my example. Um, so I have here uh, other examples. Uh, if you look at this table, I claim that this functional dependency holds employee ID. Uh, let, uh, no, so let, let me start with the second one. Let me start with uh, blue. I claim that position determines the phone. Do you agree? Yes. Well, we need to find uh, pairs of tuples that have the same position. Can you find two such tuples? Second and third. Second and third, these two. Uh, and then we need to check that they also have the same phone. Do they have the same phone? Yeah, right here. So this functional dependency holds. Yes? So just because you have that property, that doesn't mean that it's always going to hold for the True. future, right? Like, you wouldn't say that about city determining social security in the last one. This is a very important observation. It's a source of confusion. The fact that it happens to hold on, on this small table that I put on the screen, uh, that position determines a phone, doesn't mean that it will always hold. This is not the way you should discover functional dependencies by examining the data, except in the homework where you have exactly such a question. I give you 1,000 records, and you have to discover the functional dependencies. But in practice, how do you find out about these functional dependencies? Think about it. You think about it, but essentially during your analysis, you, 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 you understand the applications that you need to, to design. Uh, and the, the logic behind that application, the, the requirement analysis, will tell you what functional dependencies hold. For example, examine, uh, uh, imagine yourself talking to uh, your customer, and he says, oh, um, in our company, we save on phones. Uh, and every, uh, every position has a single phone. And it, this is what they tell you. And uh, it's a rule in our company. It has been there for 50 years. Every position has a single phone number because we, we save on phones. If this is what they tell you, what functional dependency do you write down as, uh, as part of your constraint? This one. That the position determines the phone. Because you know that for every position there is a single phone number. That, does it make sense? That's how you collect the functional dependencies. Now let's get back to this particular example. I claim that the green one also holds that employee ID determines uh, name, phone, and position. Why is that? Yes? Because it's a primary key. Now, if you think back about the definition, it's because you can't find two distinct tuples with the same uh, employee ID. So the, 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 con the condition holds vacuously. Uh, but phone doesn't determine the position. Can you give me a counter example? One, two, three, four is assigned to both clerk and lawyer. Yes, because this tuple and this tuple, they have the same phone, but they have different positions. So this company saves so much 
that actually they share the same phone number between two different positions. Okay, so um, that is how we should think about um, functional dependencies. So I, 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 I'm going here through, through uh, several details. And I invite you to think at home about the other two examples, this one and this one, and check which functional dependencies hold and which don't hold. Uh, but I want to, uh, to show you something very interesting. I claim that if you have a table, any table, on which these three functional dependencies hold, then this functional dependency will hold as well. In other words, once you list a set of functional dependencies, these are not all. Others must hold uh, by necessity. Others will follow from these functional dependencies. Why is that the case? Sorry? Uh, well, I think we, we need, to, we need to, to really think think according to the definition. So imagine the table. Imagine two tuples in this table. And uh, we need to check the, the, the blue functional dependency, right? So these two tuples, they agree on name and category. So if you think about the name and category somewhere here, they have the same values in the name and category. We need to prove what? But we need to identify the price. That uh, the, the price also agrees. That is uh, uniquely identify the price. How do we prove this? Now you look at the right functional dependencies. What do you, what do you use from there? You, you know that all three red functional dependencies hold. Yes? So you lose, you use the first one and say, look, because, because they agreed on the name, which is here, they must also agree on the color. So this would be color here. They agree on the color as well. And now you have color and category defined. So you can and now color and category, if you followed my little dots here, these are the color and category, they agree, and therefore they must also agree on the price. And bingo, these two topics must agree on the price. Now the question to ask is the following. Uh, I, I, I made this claim, which I didn't state explicit, explicitly, but I'm going to make it now. Is that by identifying uh, the function dependencies, this is how we will identify that a design is, is bad. Anomalies, update anomalies, they are related to certain function dependencies. But what we discovered right here is that once we list three functional dependencies, that is not all. There are other, there are other functional dependencies that hold. And therefore, we must find them all. What is the algorithm, what is the method that allows us to start from a set of functional dependencies and compute all the other functional dependencies that are logically implied by these? And this is a piece of theory. It's a beautiful piece. Uh, it was uh, developed by Armstrong uh, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, and it resulted in three simple rules. They are called the Armstrong rules. Uh, and you, you'll find them in different variations in the liter literature. Uh, the simplest uh, expression of the Armstrong rules is what, what you have on the slide right here. And I, I don't know what, if the book follows this uh, or, or a different variation. I'm going to show you the, the Armstrong rules in their simplest um, uh, instantiation. Again, keep in mind that the, the claim is that these are all the rules that you need to follow in order to discover all the functional dependencies that are implied by a given set of functional dependencies. So let's see how complicated these rules are. The first is called splitting and combining, and says that if you, if you have a functional dependency like this, where some A's determine some B's, that's equivalent, you can move back and forth between this and several functional dependencies where you list the B's separately. So if you have the rule at the top, you can replace it with the rules at the bottom, and vice versa. If you have the rule at the bottom, you can replace them with the rule at the top. Splitting and combining. Can, do you agree? Do, does this rule hold? It, it holds trivially. It's a very simple rule. Now the second rule, now you expect to see a hard one, right? The second rule is actually even more trivial, and it's called the trivial rule. 
and it says that it's always a case that a set of attributes functionally determines one of them. Nothing to check here. If you have two tuples that agree on all these attributes, then of course it's going to agree on, on one of them. So where is where is the beef? Well, uh, which rule will do the, the heavy lifting? Yes. Sounds like you're just defining some algebraic grammar. I, I'm defining a set of uh, axioms, if you want, uh, that, when applied, will allow us to to derive all uh, functional dependencies. But I mean, it just sounds like you're basically walking through some standard uh, axioms when you're doing a uh, sort of algebra. Well, uh, so uh, the axioms are never. So the question is if these are some standard axioms, and they are not more standard than than what I just called them. They are called Armstrong rules. They apply only to functional dependencies. Uh, now, if you dig deep into theory, uh, you, you 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 can cast them in a, in different formulas, but they were essentially uh, discovered in in the context of functional dependencies, uh, and they are quite distinct from other rules that you might have encountered, like deduction in logic um, or, or algebraic rules for proving algebraic identities. Uh, there are rules in their own right that, that uh, allows us to deduce new functional dependencies. So uh, I, I think what, what you're trying to, see, to, to, do, to do now is you're trying to connect them to something else you might have seen in algebra. And you won't be able to do this. That's, that's my point. They are specific to this particular problem of finding functional dependencies. So let me show you the last one, which is a single one that's somewhat more uh, uh, less, less trivial. Let me put it this way. It's called the transitivity rule. And it says this, that if the A's determines the B's, and the B's determines the C's, then the A's determines the C's. So, so why is that? Well, be, because, look, if you have two tuples in where the A's agree, then by the first rule, they must agree on the B's. And by the second rule, they must agree on the C's. So therefore, any two tuples that agree on the A's must agree on the C's. OK, they are very, very simple. So now let me show you how we put them into action, Armstrong rules, to derive quite interesting consequences from a set of uh, given functional dependencies. So starting with these three, uh, the blue ones here, I want to derive the last one. I want to derive the red one, this one too. But I'm going to do it step by step by deriving some intermediate functional dependencies until I reach the last one. OK? And my question to you is, which rule do I need to use? Uh, look at number four. How can you derive name and category implies name for the, from the blue ones? Yes? Two. Second rule. Uh, what, what's the name of the Armstrong rule? Trivia. Thinking about these three rules. Trivia. Is it a trivia rule? Sure. Yeah, it's a trivia, trivia rule because name is, 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 is right here. So this is a trivia. Now I see why you said two. It's, it's a second after group. How do we derive number five? Name and category determines color. Transitive rule. Is a transi transitive rule uh, using which one? The transitivity one needs to combine two rules. So it's one and. So I have name and category. It's between four plus one. You see, four takes me from name category, which I have here, but it takes me to name, not to color. But then name takes me to color. Combine them, and from name category, we get to color, exactly what we needed. It's a very mechanical application of uh, the transitivity rule. Uh, how do we get six? Trivial. It's a trivial rule. Uh, how do we get seven? Combine. Split.
splitting and combining are actually just combined. Uh, which rules do we need to combine to get seven? Five and six. Five and six, because they have the same left hand side. So we combine them and we get color and category on the right. And how do we get eight? Five. Name category implies color and uh, and and what? We are not here yet. How do we get eight? Transitivity between seven and three. Seven takes us from name category to color category. Three takes us from color category to price. Therefore, by transitivity, name category takes us to price. This is hard, right? You don't want to do this by hand. You don't want to, to write a program that combines these rules. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I'm going to show you a different way. Uh, I'm going to show you a different way to find all functional dependencies determined by a set of functional dependencies using a notion that's called a closure. And here it is. Um, think about a set of attributes, A1, A, A, N. The closure of this set of attributes consists of all the other, of, of all at possible attributes that are functionally determined by A1, A, N as much as you can determine by applying repeatedly uh, um, the functional dependencies. Okay, so for example, let's look at, uh, at name plus. Ask the question, what does name imply? Well, clearly it implies name itself, but anything else? Color. Color. Anything else? No, I don't see anything else from uh, apl by applying these rules. Uh, what about name and category? Well, name and category clearly implies name and category. What else does it imply? Well, color, because name implies color. What else? Category because co color and category implies uh, price, we also get price. And category implies department, this is why we get department. Okay, so the closure of name and category is, is much bigger. Uh, what's the closure of color? Color is an orphan, doesn't imply anything. Uh, the closure of color is just color itself. Okay, so um, the, the algorithm for computing the closure is actually quite simple. You start with a set X, uh, and it's a standard closure op operation, which is really like a, a closure um, um, in, 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 in algebra. So um, at each step, you look for some functional dependency in your set of functional dependencies. You don't have to, to consider any others in the given set of functional dependencies, such that the left-hand side is included in X. If you find such one, then you add the right-hand side. You add C to X. And you repeat this as long as you can increase X. And when you can't decrease x anymore, then you stop. And this is called the closure of the functional dependency. So let me show you this on, on, on a different example. A any questions so far about the closure? So let me show you uh, uh, the closure in action. Uh, what is the closure of AB plus? It's clearly AB. What else do we list here? C, because of this. Then? D because B implies D and E now E because we have AD which implies E and that's it. What about AF plus? B. B. Uh, and now we should be everything. Now everything, right? Because once you have an A and B, then all the rest are, are here. So C D E. And that's all. These are all the attributes. Okay, so this gives us some intuition of how we can accelerate this closure computation. Uh, the closure is monotone. If you have the closure of A AFB is bigger than the closure of AB. So you can simply copy um, what you saw before. 
Good. So now, how do we how do we use closure to compute all the functional dependencies? Well, if you think about what you need to to find the set of all the functional dependencies, there are, there are things like this. X determines some some attribute A because by splitting and combining, you, you can restrict the right hand side to a single attribute. Once you have all the closures, the question does x functionally determine a becomes does a belong to the closure of x in other words the functional dependencies that are logically implied by your set of functional dependencies are all uh, of the form x implies a for a in the closure of x Okay, so let's go back because you've seen this example. So what, what interesting functional de dependencies can you give me for AB? What does AB imply? What did we just discover by computing the closure? Well, everything else, TDE. Right, that's the notion of closure. Should I also write AB? Should I maybe write AB implies ABCD? E. We can, but on the other hand, AB always functionally determines AB. That's a trivial. So uh, that's a trivial function. So we can spare, uh, you know, we can spare information. We can spare um, adding too much, too much information by by dropping these and just saying saying E. What can you tell me about AF? What does AF functionally determine? This is uh, B, C, D, E. So the closure is a shortcut for finding all the functional dependencies. It's also a way to encode more, more efficiently uh, all the functional dependencies. You don't need to list them, but if you, if you have the closure, then you have all the information you need. Good. So now once we have this, we are making pretty good progress. I'm going to skip uh, this example here, but please go over it uh, at home. Um, we need one more information in order to understand how functional dependencies helps us avoid the data anomalies. And that is the notion of a key. Well, we haven't discussed this, but uh, obviously if you have a set of attributes that functionally determine all the others, then that set of attributes is a key, right? Because you can't have two tuples that agree on this set of attributes, because those two tuples must agree on all the all the attributes, and therefore you would have duplicate uh, duplicate tuples. So that's the definition of a key in the theory of functional dependencies, uh, and it corresponds exactly to the keys that you know in, in SQL and in the ER diagrams. Uh, but there is a wrinkle here. We actually don't call that a key, we call it a super key. A super key is a set of attributes that functionally determine all the others. So it's right here. And the key is a super key that is minimal. Did we lose connection? No. Rod, can you please help us? We don't seem to have a technical problem here. Somebody said no on the other end of uh, can, can you hear me at Microsoft? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see me moving? <laughs> yes. Ah, I can't see myself moving. <laughs> okay. That sounds like a medical problem. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a key. It's a minimal super key. So let's see this uh, in, in action. Here is a good example. Uh, what are the keys here? What is the key for this set of functional dependencies? Is color a key? Uh, is name a key? So color is not a key. Color doesn't functionally determine anything. And you need to, to determine all of them to, to have a key. Uh, so what is a key? The category name and category. Name and category. 
uh, because name and category determines price, and category itself determines color. So this is the key. How would you quickly check if a set of attributes is a key? If I give you a set of attributes, call it X, uh, is, X is X a key? How do you check this? If the closure con contains all attributes, if X plus is a set of all attributes, then then it's actually not a key. Then it's called what? Then it's called a super key. And if you can't make it smaller and still still have a key, then it's a key. Okay, so. Um, So let me see. I, I have here more examples, and I'm not going to go uh, too slowly uh, over them. I think um, we have enough information. Please try this at home. Find all the keys for this example. It's just to make sure you understand the notion of, of keys. Finally, we get back to anomalies. Remember what we discussed, that uh, we had that functionally determined functional dependency that bothered us, the fact that as the social security number by itself determines the city. And we didn't like that. We wanted to take social security number and city and put it somewhere else. So uh, the definition of, so that, that's the idea. The idea is that a function dependency is okay as long as the left hand side is a key or a super key. But if, if that's not a key, if it's just a set of attributes, then it's not okay. Then we have to take it, uh, you know, to, to put it um, uh, aside. And actually, I have the example again. Uh, what is the key in this table? Assuming that the only functional dependency that we have is this. That's the social security number determines information about the person, but not his phone, not his or her phone. What are what is the key in this table? Is this an and phone number? It's a SSN and phone number exactly. This is the key. So then, is this functional dependency okay? This is not okay because SSN itself is not a key. That is the essence of the anomalies. This is why we have all the anomalies. Because we, whenever we update or we delete or something like this, uh, we have to account for this hidden functional dependency that is between some, uh, some attribute that's not a key and another attribute. That's what we want to avoid. And this is exactly what the boy scott normal form does. Uh, so uh, let me skip this. Uh, and give you the definition of the boys code normal form. The definition is as follows. A relation is in boys code normal form if, uh, if for any functional dependency A implies B, uh, if it's either a trivial one, we can't avoid the trivial ones, or the A's form a super key. Okay? In essence, it says no functional dependencies except those that come from keys. Now, if, um, if a table uh, satisfies the boys code normal form, then, it's, uh, then uh, the, the anomalies disappeared. And you, you will see this uh, once, we, uh, once we look at examples. But if, if a table does not satisfy the boys code normal form definition, then we need to normalize it. We need to split it into smaller tables uh, until every table satisfies, uh, until every table satisfies a boys code normal form uh, definition. How do we split it into tables? Well, here is uh, the main idea, but I will show you a better algorithm in a couple of slides. Uh, but the algorithm that you get directly from the definition is the following. You choose one of these functional dependencies that violates a boys code normal form. So your A's are not uh, uh, are not a key, are not a key or a super key. 
uh, which means that the, what, whatever you have on the right hand side are not all the attributes, right? There are some other attributes that are not the bees. And it also means that the bees, they are not all, all included in the A's because otherwise you would have, uh, that would be a trivial one. So to split the table, what you do, you would create a table with the A's and B's together and then a second table with the A's and the other attributes. And if you follow carefully, uh, all these three, um, all these three sets in the Venn diagram, they are this, they are they are non-empty. So this this decomposition is does some progress. It's not vacuous, uh, and because that's that's because the functional dependency is a boys called normal form violation, which means there are others, uh, and because um, it's not a trivial one, which means there are B's that are not A's. Okay, but instead of, of uh, using this slide, you can ignore that slide completely because I'm going to show you a much better uh, algorithm. And that is, um, that is right here. Uh, and I'm not sure the book contains it. I, I think that's a much better way to describe uh, the Boyce code normal, uh, Boyce code normal form uh, normalization process. Uh, so please um, um, try to follow this carefully. It says this, start with a table and pick a set of attributes x, such that when you compute its closure, its closure is not a set of all attributes. What does this tell you about x? If I tell you that x plus is not a set of all attributes, what does it mean? What is x or what is it not? Yes? It's not a key. It's not a key. It's not a super key. And also, x is not x plus. We have seen examples when uh, you, com you compute the closure and you don't get anything else. What does it tell you about uh, if x, x is not x plus? Yes? It doesn't imply anything. It does imply something. There is, it there is some trivial. function. Sorry? It would only be trivial relations, right? If x were equal to x plus, then you could have only trivial functional dependency starting from x. But since it's different from x plus, there are some non-trivial ones. Okay, so you find such an x. That's your first step. Once you found it, you simply split your table into the following two tables. One consists of, uh, of, of um, x union y. This is just x plus because I, I denoted y, the difference between x plus and x, the, the new attributes. So one is, uh, uh, contains uh, all the attributes in x plus. And the other table consists of x and the rest, the z's, the, the attributes that are, that are right here. The attributes that b b are not contained in uh, X plus. Let me erase what I wrote so you can read the, um, uh, the algorithm more carefully. So again, we uh, find a set such that its closure is strictly bigger than the set X, but it's not big enough to contain all the attributes. And that by itself represents a violation of the voice code normal form. And then we split the table into two sets of attributes. Uh, one set contains X plus, this may be a better notation here, we just put x plus. And the other table contains x and all the attributes that are not in x plus. Okay, so let's see this in action. Uh, and I'm going to use this example here. And let's go through this together and slowly. Here is a, a table. Uh, uh, a person, uh, we have a name, we have a social security number, we have age, we have a hair color, and we have a phone number. And somebody tells us that the functional dependencies that hold are these two. The social security number determines the name and age, and the age determines the hair color. What are the update anomalies? Hard to see at this level, right? 
uh, but it's much better if we check for the Boyce code norm for, for violations of the Boyce code normal form, and if we find some, then we normalize. So help me, help me find a set X that represents a violation of the Boyce code normal form. SSN. SSN. Let's try it. Uh, you know, if it's wrong, then we we, we try again. What is SSN plus? Should be strictly bigger, but not too big. What is, but what is it? Name. Uh, so uh, let me start with SSN. Then we have name, age, and hair color. So it's it's clearly bigger, but isn't it too big? Does it contain all the attributes? No. No. This is a violation of the Boyce code normal form rule. So we split the table person into two tables. Let me call them R1 and R2. R1 contains what? Which attributes? All these. So uh, contains SSN, name, age, and hair color. And R2. What does it contain? Sorry? Phone number. SSN and phone number. phone number, which is the other attribute that was not included. What are the keys? What is the key in R1? SSN. SSN. How do you know this so fast? What is this closure? What's the closure of SSN? Everything in R1. That's how we build R1. That's an important observation. The way we build R1 is to ensure that SSN is a key. What is the key in R2? SSN and phone number. SSN and phone number. Emphatically not SSN by itself, because SSN has nothing left to imply in R2. We didn't think within R2 anything that SSN implies. So that's the key. This is how we normalize. This is a Boyce code normal form. But actually, are we done? We are, it's not clear yet. We need to continue to check if the resulting relations are in, in Boyce code normal form. Let's do this. Let's start with R2. Is R2 in, 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 in Boyce code normal form? Well, the, you need to check this with three relations. SSN, phone number, and both together with three sets of attributes. And you check them, and it turns out, yep, uh, this is in Boyce code normal form. So here we are done. But let's see R1. R1 has many more attributes. Can you, can you, uh, can you propose a set X of attributes in R1, uh, which, by, which violates the Boyce code normal form definition? Yes? Since we have the H. Age, let's try H. So let's compute this. What is H plus? The beauty of this process with closure is that you don't need to recompute really the function dependencies on R1. We just look them up at the top, which we remember not to include phone number. We just skip whenever you find phone number. So this is H and hair color. So uh, clearly it's bigger than x. This is good. But isn't it too big? Does it contain all the attributes? No. It's missing name. So how do we further decompose R1 into R3 and R4? R3 will have age and hair color, our x plus. And R4. No, H, and uh, yes, and now SSN and name. What are the keys? What is the key in R3? Uh, H. What is the key in R4? SSN. And that is because it was, uh, because SSN, essentially because SSN plus uh, is H and name. And and, and SSN. And now, are we done now? 
Now we are done. Uh, we still need to check for R4, but it turns out that R4 is already in voice code number four. So what is our final design? How many tables do we need to, uh, how many tables do we have in our final database design? Three tables, namely R2, R3, and R4. These are the three tables, and the keys are listed right here. So if you, if you step back now and look at, at what you have achieved, you have actually identified an interesting semantics in the data. The fact that you ended up with these three tables actually tells you something about the semantics of this data about hair color and, and ages. Uh, what does, uh, what does uh, R3 contain? What is the information that we end up storing in R3? Maybe we can give a better name. What's, what do we store in R3? How would you call this table? You know what, I would call it person. This is the base information about the person. We store its, phone, its social security number, its name and its age, uh, his or her uh, name or uh, his or her age. What can you tell me about R3? What is the semantics of R3? Every age comes with its own hair color. That's what, that's what we have in this application, right? So you don't store this in the person's table. This is we store the hair table. So uh, call call this call it hair. Uh, and you, for every age, we have a certain uh, hair color. That's the semantics that we discovered. Uh, and R two is a, the funny one in which we allow um, multiple phone numbers for the same person. Is it, that's a phone. A that's a phone um, uh, application. Is there a question there? I can't really see. Yes. I think my screen yes. is frozen. Yeah. Is there a question, to Microsoft? Yes. Okay. Uh, what if the set of possible ages is not finite? So we can't represent it. As a, we can represent only a final set in a table. But if a set of possible ages is not finite, Suppose it's a floating number, then we can't really put it to a table. Uh, so the, the, the question is a very valid question. Uh, how do we think about the, the, the case when the association between uh, a key and, and its values is, is infinite? Well, but um, think about how we got there. We got there by starting from a finite table, which was not normalized, and we split it into smaller tables. Whatever we, we end up putting in those smaller tables will only come from the bigger table, uh, which was finite. So you end up only storing a subset of your, of your function. If you want, it's going to be a finite subset of, this, of, the, um, of the graph of the function. That's what you store in, in the table. So I really, that doesn't, uh, Rod, can you hear me? Can you please fix uh, the image? Because I don't see. I can't do it unless I reboot the whole system. So. I see. Okay, so I can't see you moving. Uh, does this answer your question? Yes. Okay, any other question from Microsoft? Okay, we have a question here. Oh, you may tell us this later, but right now this is an N, like, N factorial kind of algorithm though, right? For a large number of sets, this is very taxing. Right, so the, if, you, if you think, the, the question uh, your, your colleague is asking is, think about a huge table. It has n attributes, n being like 100. And you have these functional dependencies. And now we need to compute, uh, to do the boys called normal, normalization. How, what will be the complexity of this algorithm? Will it run in, quad, in, in n square or in n cube time? What is your, your uh, uh, first uh, impression? What would be the running time of this uh, normalization algorithm? How would you call it, and more professionally? Hmm? MP complete. Sorry. MP complete. Uh, it turns out that the normalization is NP complete. It's, uh, if I remember correctly, yeah, it is NP complete. Uh, but the algorithm that we described is exponential. It runs in exponential time. 
Uh, no, factorial is a particular kind of, of, an, of an exponential, it's still exponential. And the fact that normalization is an NP-hard problem proves that unless P is equal to NP, we, we will never be able to find a significantly more efficient algorithm. So yeah, it's computationally expensive. Does this matter in practice? Well, it probably matters if you write a program that you try to sell, and then your customers will come back to you with these tables with 1,000 attributes on which your program doesn't work. Uh, but but um, and, and if, you, if you are a designer, and you design, if you are a database, uh, if you're the database designer, then probably you will, you will use a combination of functional dependency theory and just um, good, good intuition in order to design your, your end schema. So it's not so critical, the, the correct design is not so critical, uh, it does not depend critically on applying the theory blindly, but it's also based on uh, just plain good intuition of, on how to design the tables. But the, the observation is absolutely valid. The algorithm that we described is exponential, and moreover, uh, the, the problem itself is inherently complex. It is NP-complete. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this slide essentially describes what, what I just showed you. Uh, I have another example that I would invite you to, to study at home. Uh, which is this one here, but it doesn't, it doesn't add any more information to what I already showed you. Uh, what, you what you should keep in mind is that the normalization process essentially results in a tree. In a tree in which at the top we start from, from one single relation, and then we split the relation into two, and then one of them is further split into smaller ones. And the end design consists of all the relations on the leaves of this uh, of this search tree. Okay, now a question, uh, a question to you. Suppose I give you a, a relation that has not 100, but only two attributes, A and B. Can you have a violation of the voice code normal form? What if A plus is equal to A? a. Is this a violation of the boys code normal form? Well, in order to find a violation of the boys code normal form, you need to find a set X such that its closure is how? Strictly well, bigger than X, but not a big enough to contain all the attributes. So this is not a good example. Okay, an example, if a closure of an empty set would be an A. If the closure of which? Of an empty set. Ah, if the closure of the empty set would be A. Now, that's an interesting thought. We never discuss empty sets when we chose X. And actually, in the standard uh, um, theory, X is never allowed to be the empty set. But what would that mean? If, uh, uh, if that A would be a world constant, like A would be pi or something. That's exactly. That, this is what it would mean. It would mean that A has a constant value. Because any two attributes you take, sorry, any two tuples you take, if they, they always agree on the empty set. There is nothing to check. If they, and therefore, if, if this is what you want to say, that the empty set determines A, you're essentially saying that A is a constant. But you know what? I don't want to go there. Forget this. This is theory. Uh, in, the, the, in the textbook presentation of functional dependencies, and that's how it was developed historically, you're not allowed to put the empty set on the left. So the, my, my question is a very simple answer. No. If you have only two attributes, there can't, there can't be any violation. Uh, this is always in boys code number four. Unlike a relation with three attributes. Can you give me an example? of a set of functional dependencies for which this is not in voice code normal form. A implies B. Just A implies B. Right? What would be the key here when A implies B? A and? A and? C. A and C. Uh, and therefore A implies B is a violation. How would you decompose it? 
into R1 consisting of A and B, where A is a key, and R2 consisting of A and C. Where the key is both A and C. Where the key is both A and C. Thank you. Okay, I have another question. Let me use green. And I'm going to use this. Uh, is a key unique? In SQL, in SQL, every uh, uh, table has a unique key. But now with the theory of functional dependencies, a key is not something that you decide to make a key. It's, it's, it's something that's defined by the set of functional dependencies. Can it be the case that you have more than one key? that you have two keys. And I would like to, you to, to think about the simplest example when you have just two attributes. Can you have two separate keys? Not A, B a key, but can you have both A being a key and B being a key? And it's not a compound key either. It's I don't want a compound key. I want each of them to be separate a key. Yes? You mean that A implies B and B implies A? Exactly. Here is a simple example. A implies B and B implies A. Then A is a key and you can choose that as primary key on your table. B is a key. You can choose B as a primary key on the table. SQL doesn't allow you to, SQL forces you to, to choose one. But in, in the theory of functional dependency, there is no distinction be between them. They are both keys. I've done that. Sorry? I've done that. You've done what? Yeah, a relation where there's two keys. Yeah, I think the, the, this occurs quite often in practice when you just have two two different identifiers for the same record, and then you need to you need to choose one of them. Okay, so uh, one last thought about uh, the decomposition itself. So, what did we do when we de decomposed? This is what we did. We took a table with many attributes. And we split it into two tables with uh, 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 subsets of attributes. This is called decomposition. And, and the way you populate these two tables, if you had the, the, the data for the first table, is you, you just project. You project on the A's and B's to populate R1, and project on A's and C's to populate R2. Now, my question is, does this always work? For example, Look at this table here. Uh, we had name, price, and category, and I decided to store them into two different tables, name and price, and name and category. Okay? So uh, in name and price, we get gizmo, and 1999 we get as price. You never store it twice. Relations are sets, and duplicate tuples are just not, not, not present. They're, they're, uh, you just have unique tuples. So how would you describe this decomposition? Is it a correct decomposition or do you think it's incorrect? In other words, if, if your initial data was at the top, this one, but I don't give you this. Instead, I give you these two tables. Can you uniquely reconstruct the top table from the two tables at the bottom? Yes, in this case, what do you need to do to them? Join on name. Join them on name, and after you join them, you get exactly the table at the top. Is this always the case? Can we always choose some attributes and split it in two, and then join them back and get the original table? Depends on that. It depends. When, when, when we get the same table, then it's called a lossless decomposition. But sometimes you don't, you don't have a loss of this composition. Look, look at this example here. Uh, so here I split into name and category uh, and price and category. So um, what happens if you, if, if you join them back? What are you missing or what, what goes wrong when you join back uh, the two tables at the bottom to try to reconstruct the table at the top. Yes? Both instances of cameras will have both prices. Both instances of camera, these two, 
they will join because as part you can join on you will join on category and you get uh, all four combinations right but that's not what we had we, we had we only wanted these two combinations so that's a problem this is a lossy decomposition so sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work but, but when we apply this to the boys code normal form it turns out that if the functional dependency A implies B holds, then the decomposition into A, B's, and A's, and the rest is always lossless. And if you, can, if you think about it, what, what happens behind the scenes, you will, you will convince yourself, and I actually I advise you to do this at home, convince yourself that once you partition the table into these two tables, when you join them back, you will reconstruct uniquely the information that you had in the original table. This is what makes the uh, Boyce code uh, normalization work. The fact that the, the result in the composition is always loss, uh, loss less. Okay, and that's all I, I uh, had to say about, um, um, about the Boyce code normal form and, and normalization. Any questions? Yes. Theoretically, it makes lots of sense, but because of uh, something that was mentioned earlier, that if data changes, some of these relationships may not be true over time. Are there tools that actually do this, and do people use this actively? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question that actually um, also bothers me. So how, how much do people use this in, in, in practice, and how much do they just rely on, on uh, correct design? The, uh, so clearly, it offers a good foundation. Whenever you, you are designing your initial database schema, it's good to keep this in mind, even if you end up using more the intuition than the exact normalization steps. Uh, if the database changes, if the, if the requirements change, and some of your functional dependencies disappear, that's kind of the most, more likely scenario, uh, then you, you're in trouble anyway. It doesn't matter how you arrive to your design. If some of your assumptions change, then you need to change the schema, uh, and this is a painful process uh, that essentially affects uh, your applications. Uh, all your queries you need to be rewritten over uh, the redesigned schema. So it's something you'd like to postpone as much as possible. Um, but it's a very popular uh, piece of knowledge. People know about, especially about a third normal form. Uh, uh, they understand functional dependencies, and, they, and usually the database practitioners, they, they know um, what the functional dependencies and normalization gives you. Namely, it, uh, it allows you to avoid anomalies. Anomalies. So you know, it's it's like it's like knowing calculus. Okay, very few people apply calculus, but it's good to know it because then you understand uh, better what you're doing. And if, if anyone has insights about what you're actually doing, do, what you're doing at your job, if you use normalization theory or just plain old uh, good intuition for for a good design, let me know. I'm interested to hear this. It's a question that, that, um, that, that bothered me. In terms of tools, there are plenty of tools out there uh, that do normalization for you. So yeah, you can find tools. Uh, do people use them? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good sense. I, I didn't hear too many people using uh, uh, this, the, the exact rigorous stop for normalization in practice. OK. Please take a look at the book for next time. Uh, it's a third normal form. And we will have a brief discussion at the beginning of uh, what diff the differences are between the boys code normal form and the third normal form. The third normal form is much more confusing. Uh, please take a look at the book. And if there are no more questions, then have a good night. Uh, uh, please remember to turn into homework on, on, when, on Tuesday. And you can already start working on the second homework. Thank you.